So thanks for joining everyone. Um, this morning, we are hosting our fourth panel of the CGIR platform for Big Data and Agricultural's digital discussion series on COVID-19 and food security. This panel is focusing on bridging gaps and building resilience with digital agricultural platforms. We launched this discussion series to bring together emergent research and on the ground realities together in conversation to map out the direct impacts of COVID-19 across food value chains and glean data-driven recommendations and solutions. So thanks so much for joining us this morning. Um, we're really happy to welcome Sophie Rotman, project manager at the Media company, uh, Ashu Sikri, project strategist at Digital Green, Musumi Das, associate fellow at the National Council of Applied Economic Research, and Carlos Castellanos, co-founder and COO of Copivando Futuro. So um, just to, to get us started this morning, there's a poll for, for any attendees if you want to weigh in on how you're feeling and uh, the topics that you're interested in and care about, uh, please submit your responses to the poll. Uh, we also have a link to a share board where you're welcome to um, connect with other, with other attendees and exchange information, do some networking there. Um, that link will be in the, in the chat. Um, so the structure of today is that we have four panels presenting, as I mentioned. Each panelist will present for five minutes, followed by um, a question and answer and discussion section. Um, so feel free to submit your questions to each of our panelists via the uh, Zoom's Q&A box. And I will do my best as moderator to get as many of those questions posed to the panelists as possible. Um, and then once we've wrapped up with all the speaker presentations, we'll have um, a brief brief uh, time for further discussion at the end. Um, so to kick us off, I think we should take a group photo. Um, so we're gonna, everyone, everyone put on your best uh, Zoom, Zoom smiles and we'll do a quick selfie to, to warm up. All right, Marianne's gonna snap the picture. Done. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, so our first presentation this morning is uh, Sophie Rotman. Um, Sophie is project coordinator at the Medii Company, a social enterprise that addresses the information needs of East Africans through sustainable and research-based media productions. She currently oversees the production of Shamba Shape Up, East Africa's largest farm makeover show on smallholder farms. She's committed to bridging the gap between research on climate smart agriculture and farmers who could benefit from these findings if communicated with in a simple and accessible way. Um, so uh, Sophie's going to present on a mobile phone based panel survey attached to an advisory service that's being tested in 47 counties across Kenya at the moment. Take it away, Sophie. Hello everyone, um, Hannah, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm just gonna begin sharing my screen and I hope everybody can see it. So one second. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, looks great. Okay. Um, okay, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Sorry. Okay, so um, can I? Oops. Okay, so today I'd like to um, talk a little bit first about uh, media and the work that we do at Media before jumping into um, the work that we've been doing with Siat around um, COVID and also what we would like to do going forward um, around tackling COVID through digital tools. There we go. So Media is an organization that looks at how we can use media to support education and development. And the program that we're probably most uh, known for, especially here in Kenya, is Shamba Shape Up, um, which is a farm makeover on smallholder farms. So what happens is um, we visit smallholder farms across Kenya, Tanzania, we've been in Uganda as well. And we approach the farmers and we'll say, hey, Elizabeth, um, what are some of the key issues you have? And she might say the rains have been coming really late or at a time like this, she might say, um, I haven't been able to access markets because um, of the roadblocks or because of the lockdown. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll bring on the expert onto the farm 
and look at a set of different issues. So um, have you considered crop rotation because you could um, use beans to fix nitrogen into the soils and the next season you can plant maize there or have you considered rainwater harvesting? Um, so the program goes over 26 episodes from March all the way through to September and we begin with issues around planting, seed selection and so on, all the way to um, pest and disease management, uh, harvesting and storage. Um, so Shamba Shape Up is now in its 10th series and has actually shown to be really impactful. Um, after the second series, we had a big piece of research was done um, through Reading University, Wageningen University, and they researched over 13,000 farmers and actually showed that the um, impact that um, uh, in terms of increased value in maize and milk production directly attributed to changes that people had made from watching the program was $24 um, million. So, uh, sorry, there. Um, so Shamba Shape Up um, in its first, in the early days, um, had a lot of calls coming in and people would be trying to access our producers, our director and so on to find out more information on how they could change their farm or what they could do on their farm. Um, and this um, prompted us to create a mobile service called iShamba, which is a backup, mobile backup to the program and we promote it on the program. And essentially we say, if you have any more questions around you know, dairy production, um, climate adaptation, um, weather, send us a, a, an SMS, you can join the platform. There's a free service and a paid service and essentially farmers receive weekly information on um, crops that they're interested in um, or livestock that they're interested in, market prices for two chosen markets, weekly weather forecasts. They can access the call centers and put questions to um, trained agronomists. They can access WhatsApp groups. Um, they can receive promotional offers. So uh, last year we partnered together with um, CN and we um, put in a bid to the big data platform um, around a, a game called Let It Rain. Um, and what we try to do there is really see how we can use digital tools to reach farmers um, and, and provide them with weekly information, um, but also understand how they wanna engage with weather, how are they accessing weather and so on. And so this has led us to the current project that we're doing, which is a, sur a survey on COVID and how COVID has impacted farmers. Um, and what we're looking at there is really, um, we've surveyed over a thousand farmers um, and we wanna understand how is COVID impacting their farm activities specifically? Um, because in the beginning, there was a lot of um, information around um, health and there's a lot of um, initiatives done around health. But when we look at farming, there's a whole different impact and we would want to understand that so that we can actually address it through iShamba and through Shamba Shape Up. Um, so I just wanted to present some key findings from this survey. So one thing uh, we were asking is how are people accessing information around COVID? And what was really interesting is that over 60% are accessing the information from TV and radio. Um, only you know, under 20% were getting it from local government and then even less than 10% from neighbors, friends and family members. So again, showing that this is a really new issue um, and that people maybe don't have the access, aren't using the access channels, family and friends maybe have less impact than they, they do traditionally. And again, what can we do to bridge that gap? Um, what was really interesting is when we were looking at what are the effects of the restrictions. So in Kenya, particularly, uh, we had a lockdown in Nairobi um, and uh, we had a lockdown across counties, so you couldn't leave your county. Uh, but there was also a curfew. So when we look at what the effects of our restriction, we see that uh, for over a third um, of the respondents, the biggest impact was that um, their produce was harder to sell. So that's a really big impact. And when we look at the questions coming into the call center, they're very much around market access, um, but also accessing um, inputs. So we see here over 20% had reduced the access to inputs, so seed, fertilizer, pesticides. Um, and you know, not surprisingly, uh, less time available for farm activities ranked very low because time is not so much the issue, but it's really about how to, to access markets. Um, another interesting finding was when we look at at what are other risks uh, related to COVID or what are other risks that farmers are facing in this time is that actually over a third are, are saying that um, the weather was too wet or they had issues around flooding. Um, and again, over one third are saying pests and disease infestations was a key issue. And when you look at the context of Kenya at the moment, uh, we had floods um, and we also had locust infestation here. So those are again, two key issues that are still going on despite um, COVID. So, um, I think this really brought us to think about, okay, what can we do to support farmers? Because COVID might be an issue, but as much as it isn't a health issue, it's actually having a, a huge economic impact on farmers. Um, 
as are other issues. So for us going forward um, at uh, Media, looking at iShamba and, um, and Shamba Shape Up is we really want to continue using these digital tools and partner with other organizations, continue working with CIAD, um, partner with CCAFs and other um, organizations looking at climate change to scale some of the solutions that, you know, the researchers have come up with. Um, going forward. So Aishamba, together with um, SIAD, we're going to extend the current survey to cover 3,000 farmers and actually have a panel so we can look at what is the impact of COVID for farmers in three months' time, six months' time, a year's time possibly, and follow some of the same farmers to see what are also the interventions that have, uh, been, you know, have taken place um, from now. Uh, for Shamba Shepa, we're really trying to focus on climate smart agriculture. Um, again, keeping in mind uh, the issues linked to COVID, but also the issues linked to flooding, um, pest and disease, and so on. So we are really looking at uh, possibly including a weekly weather forecast into the program, um, looking at issues around quality access of seeds um, and accessing seeds that are drought resistant, early maturing in the face of changing um, weather. Crop insurance being a key way that farmers can actually still have an income, to, you know, even if they, their, their crop is ruined by floods, for example conservation agriculture, silage and haymaking is a really key issue that we've looked, looked at a lot in the past. Um, so supporting farmers to, um, still feed, you know, being able to feed their cows during droughts and therefore still being able to milk their cows in the drought and they can actually still continue selling their milk um, even at a higher price when nobody else is taking their milk to market. Um, soil management, water management, nutrition. So those are just some of the really key issues that we would like to look at going forward. And those are also some of the lessons we've had from this from the survey that we're doing and the work that we've been doing with farmers. So yeah, we hope that we can engage with all of you and um, I'm very open to any questions you might have. Thanks so much, Sophie. This is such a dynamic project. Um, the first question that I want to pose to you is that um, in many parts of the world, uh, women-headed households are expected to be hit harder during the pandemic. Um, but also can provide some very valuable feedback on um, challenges that they're facing and potential solutions to bridge gaps. Um, would you be able to talk about some specific and unique needs and strengths of women smallholder farmers that you're seeing at this time? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, for us, it's always been key to uh, try and engage with women as much as possible. For, so for example, with Shema Shape Up, we know that over 60% of our audience are women. Um, Aishamba has a similar distribution between men and women. And I think what's become really key in this time is um, how, who, who has what roles to play in across the whole agriculture value chain with women being doing a lot of the time, most of the work. So when, you know, from planting to weeding, that's a very much a job that, that a lot falls um, into the hands of women, but also taking crop to market. And at this time where people aren't able to access, access markets and farmers and farm families are not able to access markets, I think it's really key to see how to support them because that's, uh, the, that's a task that's mainly done by women. And that's, main, that's often the, you know, the only income that, that family generates. So I think it's important to involve them and see what are also the issues, whether it's um, you know, issues around curfew, so not wanting to be out late um, anymore. I mean, the curfew has been raised to 9 p.m. and when it was at 7, I think that was certainly a concern as well. Um, not being able to cross roadblocks because you can't get to the county where you would otherwise sell, becoming not having brokers anymore to come and actually take the, the, the produce from your farm. So yeah, I think women, you know, need to be a big focus of, of these surveys and um, the interventions that come after. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and seeing that so many, more than a third of, of respondents from your COVID survey have indicated that one of the major challenges they're facing is difficulty and selling produce. Um, are you seeing farmers turning to new channels or developing other coping strategies to, um, to sell produce to make up this loss of income? Um, I think what, we're, we are, what we are seeing through iShamba, we have um, a WhatsApp platform as well that uh, farmers can access that on the premium model. And what we're actually seeing is people using that much more as a, as a, as a marketplace. So uh, people saying, I have harvested, I don't know, two tons of potatoes um, because they're grouped with people in their region, um, you know, saying who, who would like to take these off my hands or looking for things and using that much more as a way to sell and buy produce because, um, you know, the, the usual means are not available. So I think those kind of solutions are key because they 
they're self-organized people on the platform they recognize they're in the same area and they just use use that because that's you know what's available to them right it's like a, a direct connection that they're able to make during this time exactly yeah, yeah and there's nothing in between that so we're not even you know we we mediate and we oversee the platform but we're not um you know if people want to interact and you know um, exchange numbers and carry on the conversation off the platform then that's that's great and we're not um you know we don't interfere with that in any way mm -hmm. Thanks so much for the presentation, Sophie. If any um, attendees who are just joining uh, have further questions for Sophie, feel, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A box and we can always come back at the end. Um, our second presentation will be from Ashu Sikri. Ashu is a product strategist at Digital Green, a global NGO that uses technology and partnerships to support smallholders increase their incomes. Digital Green focuses on using participatory videos shared via multiple digital channels to strengthen public extension services. Ashu previously led strategy at Crux Informatics, a fintech startup that manages data delivery and operations for financial service companies. He was also an early stage impact investor with Omidar Network, a philanthropic investment firm, and started his career at o Odox Group, a Boston-based private equity firm. Ashu studied economics and finance at the Wharton School um, at the University of Pennsylvania and is presently based in Mumbai. Uh, so great. Ashu's point uh, will present on um, har har harnessing the collective power of technology and grassroots level partnerships to economically empower farmers. Feel free to start whenever, Ashu. Excellent. Thanks, Hannah. And can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes. Yeah, excellent. Um, great. So first, I'll just start with a quick introduction on Digital Green. Um, so as Hannah mentioned, we, we are big believers in the power of technology to empower smallholder farmers to lift themselves out of poverty. Um, you know, our core work and, and the organization has been around since 2006. And I think a lot of people will know Digital Green for its video based extension work that's reached um, pretty significant scale here in India and also in, in a few other countries in South Asia and also in, in Africa, um, over 2 million farmers and, and has been you know, very impactful in terms of the um, increase in adoption of, of practices and an increase in, in, in yield as a result of those um, improved practices. And, and that model is, is really, you know, been embedded in the government extension system now where communities produce and disseminate videos amongst themselves featuring local farmers. Um, as with everything else, COVID has, has really disrupted that model. And instead of being kind of a, you know, uh, development, you know, extension worker mediated um, sort of solution now we're experimenting with how we can go direct to farmer um, via messaging tools and, and more targeted and contextually relevant videos. Um, but but that that's sort of the, the foundation of, of a lot of our work. Um, we have two other kind of big pillars to our work. Um, one's uh, an initiative that's um, focused on, on, on a multi-year grant in Ethiopia right now called FarmStack, which is all about um, you know, publishing open protocols for secure data discovery and exchange. Um, which, you know, for folks who are in the research space or have, have um, interesting data sets they've built through, um, you know, um, community-based work or, um, you know, ag tech startups to, to get access to data um, and governments also in a, in a way that's, you know, easier and, and less frictionful than, than exists today, that, that's FarmStack. And, and the last bit that I'll spend more of my time on today, and I think it actually picks up really nicely on some of the stuff Sophie, Sophie talked about is, is around market access, right? Um, and, and obviously with COVID, we saw you know, massive disruptions to existing supply chains. And, you know, you could argue supply chains were not, not working in, in favor of smallholder farmers to begin with anyway. And the, the recent, you know, experience just, just underlined that. Um, we've, we've done a few experiments in the past. Um, we, we launched Loop, which is a um, kind of an Uber pool for first mile logistics for farmers to take their produce to Monday, um, which is, you know, the local markets here in India. Um, we were working with, with about 23,000 farmers in a couple states in India. Um, with that initiative. And what I'll be talking about today is an initiative we launched more recently, kind of post-COVID, um, around connecting farmers um, and, and farmer groups directly to local customers. Um, and for us, it's a, it's a unique opportunity, given the huge ex acceleration and in behavior change on the, the customer side, to one, be more comfortable ordering food online, um, and two, to, to, to want to have transparency and visibility to where their food comes from. Um, we think we're really able to, to speak to that. And then on the producer side, you know, create, creating a channel that can really increase income and be a more durable sales channel where, where farmers have a lot more agency and control over who they sell to. Um, and so 
what exactly are, are, are we building? Um, it's funny that Sophie mentioned WhatsApp as well. We're, we're actually leaning very heavily on, on WhatsApp and chatbots as kind of the main medium for this. Um, and, and what we're doing is giving flat farmers an, a very easy way to list their products, first of all, right? So what do they have available to sell? Um, you know, exploring partnerships with um, firms that can do quality of saying um, using AI-based technologies that can do it just based on a photo um, to help communicate the, the quality parameters as well. Um, and then, you know, price and, and you know, uh, other, other important information. Um, you know, making that catalog available in a very intuitive way to um, consumers, um, heavily video-based, again, WhatsApp native, so it's very kind of conversational and easy for people to interact with and place orders. Um, what we're doing is, is, you know, kind of changing the paradigm that exists in India, at least, where we're, we're, we're expecting the, the farmer groups to do a lot of the primary value addition and packaging and delivery logistics. Um, obviously, you know, early days, we'll be providing support to enable that. But what we're finding is that if, if we give farmers that agency, that the, the realization they can have is significantly higher than, than the existing model where there's a lot of intermediation. Um, and a lot of those activities are done by someone else. And then finally, some, some again, um, easy workflows that, that enable, you know, notifications, dispute resolutions, all, all the things that, that you need to do when you're running a consumer business, but, but do it in a way that's, that's really, you know, low barrier to entry, really intuitive and, and easy for, for farmers to, to start to do themselves. So I'll just quickly show you kind of what this looks like. Um, we're, you know, we're in early stages of, of doing kind of a, a version two of a pilot. Um, we, we did a pilot earlier uh, summer um, working with farmers in Bihar to help them market um, lychees, which are a seasonal fruit um, here, here in India and in other parts of the world, um, you know, um, which was successful and I think kind of emboldened us to, to, to really invest in this further. Um, you know, what you're seeing is the interface for a farmer to create a catalog, right? So, you know, th this is what you do to create an e-commerce site, right? Wh which is, you know, significantly easier than having to code anything up or, you know, go through, you know, even some of the you know, other kind of web-based tools that exist. Um, what it looks like from a consumer perspective, right? Um, you know, seeing videos, building that direct connection with the farmer, feeling like you have visibility to how they grow, why they grow, what practices they employ, and then very easily being able to, to consummate a transaction. Um, and finally, you know, being able to provide reviews, being able to, um, you know, have workflows for some of the customer support issues that come up. So I'll actually stop talking and hand it over um, to show you guys just a brief video um, helps maybe bring this to life a little bit. So, um, Anna, over to you. Namaste, Andy. My name is Mullapudi Harichandar Prasad Chaudhary. I'm going to talk to you about the first time I'm going to talk to you about the first time I'm going to talk to you about it. इधर बैठे नहीं किन्हें चुप रखो तो आवश्यक है नंदी इधर नंदी हमने चिकन लोट टोटी कीपिंग क्वालिटी नेलो सामर चुंगड़ ओमर मटर तो आप कुर्ते आवश्यक हैं जैसे नंदलो ये को तीव्र दानो ये को रुचि वस्तु में टच देंगे Great, thanks, Ashu. Um, that water, watermelon looks so so delicious. What a harvest! Exactly, and and it's just a, a few clicks away from being able to order and and get it delivered direct to home from a farmer. So can't lose. Yeah. So my first question um, for you is, what opportunities um, has this shift from? from more community-based um, tools of, of knowledge sharing to direct to farmers, what opportunities has it presented both for Digital Green and for farmers themselves, either um, unexpected or, or anticipated? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is that, you know, while the community video model is incredibly powerful because you have kind of that, that, that social trust, it's, it's not always the case that every single person in that room is growing the same crop or grappling with the same issues. Um, and so being able to really deliver um, tailored and contextually relevant advice to the farmer based on where they are, what's happening in terms of weather, where in the cropping cycle they are. I mean, just, just being able to really um, target 
um, messages based on, on some of those external characteristics and, and some of the data that the farmers are sharing with you around where they are um, is, is probably the biggest shift and, and opportunity, I would say. Um, and, um, you know, in some sense, we were kind of heading in that direction anyway, right? People talk about precision agriculture and, and how you can really, you know, le leverage, you know, data to, to provide that. And then COVID meant that, you know, the community-based model was, was not going to fly, right? So um, it sort of accelerated us to, to, to really figure out how we, how we could do it. So that's probably the single biggest part of it from, from our perspective. Yeah, yeah. So many of the panelists that we've heard from throughout this discussion series have commented on the uh, acceleration that that COVID has mandated for some of their initiatives. Um, do you see some of these new projects that that Digital Green has taken on because of uh, COVID situations as projects that um, can lend long term resiliency to food systems and to the work that you do? Yeah, I, I think the the market access work in particular, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, one of the, the angles to it that I didn't, you know, spend a lot of time talking about is, you know, one, we're, we're keeping the kind of cluster of consumers and producers in a very small geographic area, um, less than 100 kilometers. Um, and the reason for that is to kind of promote that that notion of circular and hyperlocal economies and, and the resilience that that has, and also just kind of keeping things, you know, with a low carbon footprint. Um, and another angle to it is, you know, as we've done some consumer research, you know, there, there are other online grocery platforms and, and, you know, local vendors you can go to. But one of the things we're trying to showcase is producers that are growing, you know, that are employing sustainable practices and also growing some indigenous crops that are obviously more, um, you know, environmentally friendly, more resilient um, and, and kind of, um, you know, often the, 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 the way that inputs are sourced for those is a little bit more um, sustainable. And so um, I think embedded in some of the work is this orientation to say, okay, how can we take this opportunity to not only, you know, you know, address a challenge, but also kind of put us on a different path forward, one that, um, you know, is more in line with, with I think, the, the vision that a lot of consumers have, have either an explicit or kind of latent interest in seeing, and, and one that's um, also um, supportive of, of, of increased farmer income and resiliency. Yeah, I think that that agility is, is very important. Um, we have some questions coming in for, for you, Ash. Uh, I'll, I'll pose this first one. Um, does the project cover the issues addressed by the climate smart farming approach? Um, oh, I'm sorry, this question appears to be for Sophie. I'll pause it or uh, pose that one at the, at the end of the discussion. Um, okay, uh, another question coming in from SIM. If a farmer who's illiterate and has no knowledge about smart technology, um, how, how could your services work for them? It's a good question. And, and look, we, you know, we have limits, right, in terms of who we can reach, especially in, in something that is very chat based or WhatsApp based. One of the funniest kind of, uh, you know, angles to this is we've done research is in a lot of cases, it's not the, the farmers themselves that are using the smartphone, it's actually their kids. Um, and their and their kids are the ones who are kind of the, the, the gatekeeper and the entry point. And so, um, you know, you know, our, our view is that, um, you know, between a combination of, you know, increased smartphone penetration, lower data rates, you know, you know, large families where, especially in India, where you've had this huge reverse migration back from cities into the villages, where, where now it's more likely that there's a family member that, you know, has, has come back with, with a phone and, and a bit more internet savvy. And then finally, you know, kind of this, this network of local kind of entrepreneurs, um, you know, shopkeepers, input providers, et cetera, that can kind of play a role in, in supporting even the, the ones that are, that are most marginalized and most disconnected from, from, from a technology perspective, um, that, 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 that reach will get there. But, um, you know, it's, it, you know, th th there are limits, right, when, when we have a model that's, that's designed to be kind of very tech enabled. Um, and and that's, that's, you know, something that, that I think we'll continue to think about how we can, how we can expand uh, access around. Okay, a last question for you, Ashu, from the audience, um, from Netra. What are your experiences with farmers adopting organic agriculture? Do they show promising results in terms of food security? Um, I think that the headline answer is, um, you know, organic definitely does command a price premium, which is great. Um, organic is a smaller addressable market, right? But awareness is growing. Um, I think one of the, the challenges is that the official certification is is quite onerous, and especially for smallholder farmers, I think is, is sometimes out of reach, right? In terms of just the, the certifications and the, the hoops you have to jump through to kind of get the, the, the formal designation. And so, um, you know, one of the, the the perspectives we have on this is, you know, you know, 
enabling farmers to kind of communicate what it is that they're doing um, and, and, and creating that direct connectivity between consumers and producers um, can sometimes take the place of like a formal guarantee that, that might al not always be as easy to, to achieve. Um, and, you know, I think there's, um, th there, there's so many of these, um, these certification standards that are out there that um, rather than, than wetting ourselves to a specific standard, it's this idea of, you know, what are, you know, if, if, if farmers are ultimately able to, you know, build, you know, direct connectivity with their customers and understand their requirements, right? You know, responding to buyer requirements and, and the aware, the increasing consciousness and awareness around what um, people put in their bodies are, are going to drive that that change to say, we, we don't want chemicals, we don't want pesticides. We, we want to make sure that, that you guys are, are employing practices that, that align with those expectations. That, that'll ultimately drive it, um, whether there's a formal stamp or, or something that, that, you know, that, that, that's kind of less important, I think, at the end of the day. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to give this uh, question another try because I, I think it actually was addressed to, to you, um, but just citing Aishamba as, as discussed by Sophie. So does your project cover the issues addressed um, by a climate smart farming approach similar to Aishamba, such as soil management, conservation, uh, nutrition, and does the project interact with producers at a local level to um, share this knowledge with farmers? Yeah, so I guess I would, I would distinguish the market access work, which is really think of it as like providing tools for farmers to do sales and marketing digitally, right? It's very narrow in its scope versus the, the broader work of Digital Green, which definitely does, right, um, focus on communicating to farmers, um, you know, best practices um, that are, you know, adopted from, from research agencies, governments, um, you know, our, our, own, our own work. And they're undoubtedly, you know, topics like, um, you know, the natural pest management or soil conservation or, or you know, irrigation, like th those are the things that are, that are promoted. Um, and so that, 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 you know, focusing on the production side, we view as like a distinct, you know, and, and core competency that we've, you know, helped the, the government extension bodies, you know, deliver more efficiently and more effectively in a way that actually gets adoption, right? So that, that, that's the, the foundation. And now we're looking at saying, okay, you know, We've we've seen a model that works there. What can we do on the market access side that that again is is narrower in its scope, right, um, and distinct in, in really focusing on sales and marketing. And at least in this initial incarnation, can we get farmers directly connected with with end consumers? Thanks, Ashu, for the presentation, video, and, and answering questions. And if anyone has any further questions for Ashu, feel free to um, to add them to the Q and A, and we can come back to them at the, at the final discussion. Our third presentation is from Musumi Das, who is an associate fellow at the National Council of Applied Economics Research. Musumi is a microeconometrician, and her research interests are in poverty measurement, nutrition, and health, gender, migration, and education. Musumi was an assistant professor in the economics department at Xavier University, Bhubaneswar, and prior to that, an assistant professor at IFMR KREA University in Chennai. She has been a consultant with the World Bank, where she worked with the South Asia Regional Gender Innovation Lab. She's been a visiting fellow at IFPRI in Washington, D.C., a research associate at NIBM Pune, and a mortgage officer at the Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, Musumi, you're welcome to begin presenting. Thanks, Hannah, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my, uh, I'll just start sharing the screen. Can everybody see it? Uh, can all of you see this? We're able to see, okay. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, this presentation, actually, I uh, have a couple of stories to share, and more, uh, more, more of it, I seek solutions from all of you, like the other panelists, because I presume they're all uh, working, solving real life challenges more than uh, I'm involved in. So I'm an economist by training, and I just try to bring in a couple of uh, stories that are and observations, and possibly if something can be worked out and some collaborative. Uh, Efforts. Uh, so we all are hard hit by COVID-19, and um, no can, country goes uh, is out of the list. Uh, I have something to say about uh, the city from, from which I belong to is uh, that's uh, Calcutta or Kolkata, uh, yeah, as it was renamed. It's a million plus agglomeration uh, in the eastern part of India and in the state of uh, West Bengal, and. Um, 
I'll be talking about what has happened recently in Kolkata, which is uh, 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 primarily an urban agglom agglomeration. And I'll also be talking a little bit on what happened in the Sundarbans, which uh, most of you must be aware is one of the world's uh, largest mangrove uh, forests. So COVID-19 uh, was the first to hit uh, actually the city of Calcutta in India. And recently, after the COVID-19 uh, spread hit, uh, there was a super cyclone named Omphon, which was supposed to be one of the uh, uh, cyclones with the highest destructive capacity in the past few years. And there was also a locust invasion. A locust invasion not only restricted to the eastern part of the country, but quite all, all across the northern, north and north on the eastern part of the country. As of now in Calcutta, we have uh, a high number of COVID cases, that's 40,000 plus. The case fatality ratio is rising very high, uh, one of the highest in the country, uh, and it's 100,000 plus uh, as of now. And Kolkata is uh, has been earmarked as a COVID-19 uh, hotspot. So these are three images that I want to uh, share with all of you. So uh, there's been a series of lockdowns and periods of unlockdowns. So the first picture shows in wherein uh, after a sudden, uh, uh, after the lockdown got over, uh, was lifted. Uh, People just started scouting for jobs. Everybody was rushing to get jobs. Primarily, the informal sector workers were the hardest hit. And this is uh, one of uh, the scenes from our bus stop uh, in uh, in the city when people are all queued up to avail the public transportation because the private transportation refused to apply because they wanted the uh, fares to be hiked up. The next is the kind of damage that it, uh, the cyclone Amphon has caused uh, to. The city is quite close to my house, actually. And the third picture shows uh, locust invasion, just all of a sudden, and uh, things, uh, and it damaged uh, farms and vegetable produce. And next is in uh, Sundarbans. Uh, so what happened in the Sundarbans? Uh, cyclones are frequent in this area, but in recent years, cyclones with very high intensity have become very frequent. Uh, Mangroves has been destroyed a lot. When I was working on this, uh, well, I was I was uh, proposing to work on this uh, thing. Uh, I thought that the even the uh, wildlife would have been affected, but thankfully the wildlife hasn't hasn't been affected much. But the humans have lost lost both their lives and their livelihoods. Uh, uh, households are like now female headed households, wherein the male member male members uh, uh, got caught by a tiger and uh, the household lost uh, the job. Uh, so, um, yeah, the food production capabilities of the household reduced because uh, they, have, they have more of primarily aquaculture related activities and uh, because of the cyclone, uh, the water becomes saline and previous years there's been other, many other cyclones and because of the rise in salinity level of the water, aquaculture activities have taken a downfall. So, what are some of the field level evidence? I just want to... Uh, uh, make a distinction at first. Because I, initially, I wanted to just focus on urban food security strategies because uh, that's what the city of Kolkata has been hard hit by. But then I thought that uh, bringing in uh, lessons from Sundarbans will also be interesting for the audience. So, what has all this? Uh, what is all this taught us, or what are the observations? Firstly, this uh, all the, the this triple crisis which has hit the city and the state, in fact, I'm not going into the stories of the entire state, has exposed the fault lines. It has rendered households vulnerable to both individual household specific shocks and aggregate shocks. And people have lost jobs. There has been reverse migration wherein laborers have come back to the city. They have not been allowed to enter their homes. They have been quarantined in different locations and it's been a major food security problem in both acquisition, in both availability of a variety of food items, the complete disruption of the supply chain. There was no electricity in the city for a couple of days. There was no medical facilities available. Even basic necessities, availing basic necessities had, had become uh, a pain. And all this, uh, leading, uh, all this has led to a lowering of absorption capacity of the body. Contamination of food items, especially fish products uh, during the lockdown phase, um, declining health status, uh, which all of you uh, uh, surely can sense. There's been a rising price of vegetables, fish, poultry in the city. Uh, agricultural lands have been destroyed. Uh, agricultural activities have been uh, affected. And the hardest hit have been the women in general, uh, the youth, the migrant workers, the old aged, and the disabled. A couple of relief measures, both cash and in kind, have been there from the, both the center and the state government. There has been cooked meal, provision of cooked meals, and there's a lot of uh, problems in uh, providing cooked meals uh, during uh, a period of COVID-19. So all things crept in together. 
and uh, the PDF was working uh, successfully. So people could uh, avail uh, their uh, free supply of uh, cereals and uh, pulses. I have a possible, a couple of uh, possible sustainable digital solutions as I place it. That uh, first is there are serious gaps in data collection. What, how, when we're talking of big data, we actually first need to gather data. But actually, we are not being able to gather data. In fact, uh, there were video messages that were being uh, circulated by uh, video messages by uh, the recent uh, Nobel laureate in uh, economics, Professor Abhijit Banerjee, which nudged COVID uh, symptoms uh, to increase the reporting in West Bengal. So there was, the reporting rates were quite low, and all this had a subsequent impact in, as to how to trace the beneficiaries, how to contact them, and reach out with what they need uh, immediately. Probably we can have a couple of telephone service, but again, accessing uh, uh, people on, on the mobile phones, there's, there's a whole bunch of issues with that. Uh, we can use digital solutions to, for deployment of key personnel. Uh, so the police is in charge of everything. The police has to even... Uh, take care of law and order, the police has to now during the lockdown period, go and uh, do allow, uh, go and uh, supply the rations to every household. So how can we use uh, digital solutions to uh, you know, coordinate the efforts of the police, health workers, the cleaning staff, and others? Uh, there has been missing social protection strategies for the urban poor. It's always, uh, it's not always, I mean, we need to focus on the rural poor, but the triple crisis has suddenly exposed the the urban poor has no way to go. What are the social protection strategies that we have for the urban poor? GIS mapping is possible. Uh, it's very limited in the uh, uh, limited in uh, you know tracking uh, what is happening to uh, land and farming activities. Uh, is home gardening a solution way out in urban areas? Uh, for example, hydroponic vertical farming or aqua systems in urban areas uh, uh, when uh, this kind of situation uh, creeps in. Thank you. Thanks so much, Musumi. Um, so uh, any attendees, feel free to, to add questions for, for Musumi and her presentation in the Q&A box. Um, to start off, I wanna address, so um, you, you brought to light how um, the coronavirus crisis in combination with uh, locust invasion and the cyclone, this triple threat facing um, communities has exacerbated some pre-existing vulnerabilities. Um, and then your, so the, the potential solutions such as phone survey, so surveys, um, GIS, um, digital technologies for uh, communicating best practices and guidance. Um, how do you think that these solutions can be kind of um, woven into a, a longer term plan for addressing uh, gaps in, in food systems? Yeah, so the first thing is we have to reach out to the beneficiaries. So uh, for uh, we need to uh, what my sense is that we need to have uh, we need, uh, we have the Aadhaar card. That's the uh, unique identification uh, number for every individual. So if in some way we can link our Aadhaar cards, our mobile numbers, and then we can reach out to the beneficiaries first. That's the first step. If we can uh, if we can do that, then we can connect with everybody in times of distress. I'm not saying that there can't be issues with that also, but that's first possible way that we need to think of because uh, when when there is, uh, when I'm stuck in a cyclone somewhere, I don't know how to react other than reaching out my mobile phone. I mean, if I have a mobile phone, that's the only way I can uh, reach out to people. So that is the first uh, step uh, that should be adopted in collating the data. We don't have any such database. We don't, we don't reach out to beneficiaries based on mobile numbers. Telephone surveys are very new in our country. There are, in fact, our organization has just started off with a telephone survey with, uh, uh, you know, interviewing uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, patients and people uh, who are affected by the lockdown. So that's the first step that we need to take, take up. Great, thank you. Um, again, any any questions from the audience, please feel free to direct and we can um, have Musumi answer them um, in our final discussion as well. Uh, so to, to keep on schedule, I'll, I'll pass it to Carlos Castellanos for the fourth presentation. Thank you so much, Musumi. Um, mm -hmm. Carlos is the co-founder and COO of Cultivando Futuro, an agribusiness platform based in Colombia to link up producers, organizations, and buyers, enabling them to make better decisions based on key information. 
Kylo supplies technology to create a positive social and sustainable impact within rural communities. He's an advocate for farmers inclusion. He's been a speaker in the Committee of World Food Security CFS 2019 at FAO. And as COO of Cultivante Futuro, he used, uses his expertise in agricultural knowledge and cooperation with rural communities to provide consultancy to and create alliances between organizations. So today, uh, Carlos is going to present on Cultivando Futuro's platform that consolidates key agricultural information, um, aggregating farmers data, socioeconomic data, and uh, productive info to better connect farmers. Um, go ahead, Carlos. Perfect, thank you very much. Can you hear me well and you can see my screen? Yes. Great. So good afternoon to everyone or good morning here in this part of the world. Uh, so I'm very honored to be here and to share like all our experience here, like what we are doing, like taking our hands in these challenges that we have in these times. So yes, to have like a little bit of context, we started uh, our platform like seven years ago and we saw a problem in the agriculture industry that it was that the uh, food supply chain was so de-articulated. There were organizations, farmers, and wholesale buyers and companies in the sector that didn't have like a channel to communicate with each other. Uh, and thus causes a lot of uh, situations that increases the risks for smallholder farmers. For example, they didn't have data or information to make better decisions. Uh, and so, yeah, this impacts like strongly the, the producers of the supply chain. And so we created an information platform that consolidates data. Uh, so we have a aggregation of this information of the farmers uh, that it's the social demographic and productive information that in basic words is their, uh, their data, uh, their information of their farms, their infrastructure, and also uh, their crops. So with this information, we can connect them with organizations, for example, focused on rural de development programs or companies that can provide them services. And they are not uh, more disconnected at their farms and they are part of a community. So our platform can collect this data, analyze it and deliver insights. Uh, so we can, for example, help farmers for better decision-making processes and also like participate in these inclusion uh, programs. And this is how you can see like the digital identity of each farmer. You can see their information very easily uh, and their calendarized crops. And now you can uh, aggregate this information into visual dashboards to have like an easily comprehensive situation of what ha what's happening in rural communities. And you can escalate this, for example, to the whole country or to a community or a, a state in a country. Um, and in the, at the bottom part of the, of the screen, you can see the percentages of infrastructure that will help you to take decisions in terms of if you're developing tools, what kind of infrastructure things are, are, are important. For example, we have more than 60% of farmers with uh, using WhatsApp or communication apps. So there's, there's, there's uh, something to do in that way. And also, yeah, like uh, almost 94% have a kind of, of, of telephone to communicate. So yes, I put these challenges here that we can see if there are any common points with smallholder in your own countries. So yeah, there are, for example, you can see the result of farmers and associations not having their own vehicles. And this increases the uh, cost uh, transportation fees and their options to move the food. Uh, also the increased supply, uh, supply price, uh, our important supplies are becoming expensive uh, affecting the cost of production. And also food centrals are becoming an infectious focus on food waste. Uh, uh, that what, what's happening is because their farmers can't transport or can't find uh, opportunities to, tr to do some trading. So they're like, they're, there's increasing food waste in the farms. And also, so it's important to have uh, in mind that these farmers needs like opportunities for trading and it must, you, you have to think more, uh, not just like uh, just connecting uh, wholesale buyers with farmers, but having uh, so many variables in mind. These variables uh, are, for example, location, availability, quant quality and quantity of the product. And that, with that, with that uh, kind of variables, you can strengthen the short uh, circuits of, commercial, of trading. So we created a, a calendar 
that can help you to answer uh, key questions for the Minister of Agriculture with whom we are cooperating in this program. And that are, for example, where are the crops located? Or when are the projects going to be available? Or uh, are the farmers increasing or decreasing their production? So it's very easily to make a click on each product and you can see like, where is the crop? Who is the farmer? What quantity, what quantity of, of product is going to, to be there? Uh, so yes, we are focusing on that tool and also like how we can uh, achieve communication with farmers in terms of apps or SMS or capacitations. Uh, for example, we developed this app that it's very based on chat apps, but don't have the limits about group uh, team uh, group participants, or we can have like specific uh, tools to so they can publish their their offer their products very easily. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carlos. This panel has been so strong on the fruit. We've had lychees, watermelons, mango, um, very, a sweet oriented panel. Uh, so the first question that I'll pose to you, uh, Carlos, is coming from, from Sophie. Um, she's interested to hear that over 60% are um, using smartphones. Um, she's asked, is this a reflection of the demographic of your users? Are they generally younger, perhaps larger scale farmers? And Sophie, if you would like to elaborate on your question, feel free to jump in. Yes, exactly. That, that was, well, when we started like seven years ago, that was like a myth that farmers didn't use like uh, smartphones. Uh, so it was like kind of frustrating like, when starting this, that so many people were thinking about, so farmers are not going to use smartphones, they don't have internet connectivity, and so what you're doing this. Uh, so our approach was, uh, we had in mind that it's, that was going to happen. <laughs> Uh, in the short term or in the long term. So right now we have this uh, uh, demographics about, uh, so we can ask them or they can easily uh, uh, register them in, at the platform using the app. So we know that they're using smartphones. So that was an important part. It's more than the uh, that a half of the farmer that we have to register it in this, uh, in this community of 3000 farmers and it's increasing. So yeah, with that, uh, with that metric, we decided to, to make this kind of contents for app users. And also it's important not to think that they need to use internet uh, connection, for example, 24 seven. It's just to offer their, their, their crops or in the moment they're receiving trading opportunities or receiving news. So that could have Let's talk about um, three days or so. so about uh, providing, sorry, providing uh, information like the whole time, but just like in the most important points. Awesome, thanks. Another question that I have for you, Carlos, is um, I, I'd like to hear about any gaps that the platform has already been able to fill or where you see it going um, in, in the next few months. So yes, like there are so many things <laughs> happening in agriculture. For example, uh, we saw that we have like logistics to provide and how we can help to move the food. So what we are doing, uh, we are filling the gap about information, about knowing like where are the crops uh, to prevent uh, this food waste that is happening. Uh, so we are providing this information and we are looking for the right alliances because yeah like in agriculture you have so many challenges that you want to solve them all but i think that the right approach is to focus on your more uh, strong part and then like uh, find more allies to to help for example we are providing information and we're looking for allies to uh, allies to to provide logistics uh, or for example i was talking also with a supplies company that provides good practices, uh, tips or, or short videos or information. So we can share it them with, with the farmers. So our, our approach is about to be focused on information and providing the right channels tailor-made for the farmers that can be really accessible for them. Awesome, thanks. So if you will um, end screen sharing, Carlos, and we can, we'll go back to um, all panelists view just for our final discussion. Um, 
<clears throat> so I'd love to hear from each panelist just as a wrap up, um, one uh, potential key change that needs to be made um, to build more resilient food systems that you've encountered through your work in these times, and then also a new opportunity that the pandemic has revealed. Um, perhaps we can go in, in order of presentation if Sophie's up for it to start off, starts off. Um, okay, yes. Um, thanks, Hannah. I think one of the key lessons across um, that all of, all of us have shared today is really the issue about accessing markets in a time like this. Um, and I think to, in order to make a more resilient food system going forward, market access has to become um, not only easier logistically, but I think things like market prices need to be something that farmers know from their own farm without having a broker intervene, without having to go all the way to market, which is also cost and so on. And I think that's something that's really key that can be embedded in all platforms. And Aishamba has been doing this um, by providing people market prices, but again, this could become much more accurate, more frequent, um, and especially in a time like this where it's changing so much, I think it's important to have a, a really good overview of that um, as a farmer. And I think generally going forward, really focusing on climate adaptation in across all of these platforms across all different countries is, is so important because COVID is one issue, but if it's um, paired with floods, if it's paired with locusts, if it's paired with all other um, issues that are, you know, many of which are linked to changing climate, then that's a real problem and farmers are basically, they don't have a chance. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Ashu? Um, two, two things that, that really come to mind, and I think we, we've thought about them in, in our own market access work. One is the, the emphasis on local, right? Sort of the, the long supply chains in some sense are the most brittle ones and the ones that I think have, have the biggest shock and, and that, that tells us something. Um, and, and the second is, um, you know, information broadly, obviously to, to, to the producers, but I think specifically information about um, demand, right? And, and what's, what's happening in terms of, you know, what, what are the, the requirements in terms of, of, of quantities, in terms of, you know, what, what you know, kinds of uh, growing practices are, are consumers increasingly drawn to, et cetera. I think that the more that that, um, you know, information makes its way to the producers and informs their decision making, the more, you know, they can, um, you know, be, be in position to, to, to meet that. So those would be my two, my two inputs. Thanks, Ashu. Musumi, want to weigh in? Yeah. Yeah, so for resiliency uh, and uh, using big data for resiliency, uh, so that's if that's what we need to uh, work on. Uh, shock or no shock, whether we whether there was COVID or no COVID, but I think is how we can use big data is uh, the better by having better connectivity, and only better connectivity can lead to better lives. I think we all are grappling with the issue of better co connectivity. So, COVID has just uh, COVID shock, all 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 different kinds of shocks. If all of them come together, what it has taught us taught us is that we all need to be connected in some way or the other. I think. Our focus uh, has always been on select communities, and I don't think that's going to work uh, in the near future. So we all have to be connected, whether somebody is hard hit or not, we need to be connected for better lives. Yeah, that's what I think. Thank you. Thanks, Musumi. And lastly, Carlos. Yeah, so I think there are like important things happening, like in the terms that we, we are the solutions providers uh, and yeah, so it's important to think about cooperation and about so many things that are happening right now and so many people are inspired about providing solutions, but it's important to cooperate with the solutions that are out there right now. So like each of us can provide a, a piece of this puzzle to, to, yeah, to provide our experience because so many people are inspired like in, to take action. But so yeah, it's important like to gather our knowledge and provide solutions so so we can like create this community about uh, yeah providing smallholders or uh, connecting the supply and demand or connecting yeah also services to the farmers uh, and yeah it's very valuable like the experience that everyone like here have uh, and it will be like very inspiring to to create this community about projects that are providing solutions to these big organizations that now have like the, the, the mindset of a startup that something very quickly must to be done. So we must to be there, like in order to provide this, this kind of solutions. Yeah, 
I like that that positive unifying message to end on. Um, thanks to all the panelists and and audience for joining today. Um, the session recording will be available on the Big Data Platforms YouTube channel as well as our website in the coming days uh, for your reference. And if you have any questions following this, um, please feel free to send those in. Um, Big Data at CGR cgir.org um, and if for, for any upcoming announcements about the panels to come uh, we are cgir underscore data on twitter um, thanks again for everyone it's been a pleasure an engaging session and um, have a great have a great rest of your day